welcome again to our second lecture in our series of four on lifestyle and immunity. Tonight's lecture is specifically about SARS-CoV-2, about something that is near and dear to all of us from this last year. You know, there's a lot in the news, and this is probably the most studied <coughs> virus that, at least in my lifetime, that people have had any amount of time studying. It has been an evolving situation, right? As since the outbreak in late 2019 in China, and then since we had it in our country, but it's a been an evolving, developing situation with SARS COVID 19. So, I'd say what we're going to present tonight is from the data that we know so far up to date, and there could be some changes in that for sure. Our objectives tonight are one, to gain a basic understanding of what a virus is and how it works, to learn about coronaviruses in general, and then to understand currently what we know about COVID-19 transmission spread and how it affects the body, symptoms, and other risk factors for disease. And then to discover what you, we can do immediately to decrease our risk of infection. And there'll be some other things that we'll be talking about in the third and fourth lecture that we'll mention at the end. So first thing would be to, um, this might not be a new thing for you all, but to understand what a virus is. A virus is different from a bacteria. It's considered inanimate. It's not alive, mostly because it cannot replicate on its own. It needs a host cell in order to replicate. It's non-cellular and it contains usually a strand of RNA or DNA. And they are known to infect all life forms ranging from plants and animals to microorganisms. And they can either have a specific or a broad host range. So to further discuss that, we have a short little video. So differences between bacteria and, and viruses. So coronavirus, which you've heard about, is one type of virus. And so this is just going to be a quick overview of coronaviruses. First were discovered in 1930, and they were identified in animals, so flocks of, of birds who got an infectious bronchitis. It is a virus that has basically a single-stranded piece of RNA that can be directly acted upon by protein translation mechanisms to translate the RNA into a protein. And it has basically a, a protein envelope with some spike proteins and has the appearance of the solar flare. So that's where it gets the corona, like the corona of the sun. That's where it gets the name. It's the largest group of viruses that can affect mammals and various other species, and it can infect birds and cats and cows and dogs and pigs and bats. And so various mammals and animals are affected by this, and it causes a wide range of diseases from lung infections to intestine infections, can affect the liver and even cause encephalitis in some coronaviruses in some animals. There are 30 known species of coronavirus, so it's been well known for a long time. And there are seven of those that can affect the humans and human respiratory infections. 1965 was the first human coronavirus that was identified that affected humans, and it's one of the common cold viruses. It entered the human population via spreading from animals. The most recent was SARS CoV. One, which was the first SARS outbreak, and then MERS was the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory uh, Syndrome virus that broke out, and then more recently SARS-CoV-2, which is what we've been dealing with in this, this latest pandemic. It can affect the upper and lower respiratory tract in all ages. Coronavirus are responsible for 15% of the common colds, Again, we're talking about coronaviruses in general. And then other viruses that cause the colds are influenza, rhinovirus, parainfluenza, Epstein-Barr, and RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. The most common human strains cause common colds in people who aren't sick, so immunocompetent hosts. So we're going to touch a little bit on SARS 
cov and MERS, but we'll start with SARS-CoV. It was discovered between September and November of 2002 in the Guangdong province in China. And it was the first human-human pandemic in the 21st century. Thankfully, the last known case was determined in 2003. The origin for this, similar to what we will learn about SARS-CoV-2, is considered to be bats, with the intermediate host being the civet. Total infected individuals was around 8,400 people, and about 813 were said to have died, spreading to around 29 countries. Um, at the end, the global mortality was calculated to be about 9.6%. And at the time, no vaccine was approved for that virus. It did try to make one, but it never made it past the animal study. So no vaccine was approved and they were able to contain it by public health measures. And the reason for that seems to be that the highest period of viral shedding is in the second phase of disease. Most individuals were not asymptomatic, so it was easy to identify and have people quarantine via public health measures and stop it that way. And this is just a graph from the World Health <clears throat> Organization, just showing deaths cumulative and the cumulative cases as well. So you, just a visual for you to see the deaths compared to the total cases for that pandemic. And now MERS, it came around in September 2012. It's mostly in Saudi Arabia. And this one, it can range from asymptomatic to severe disease, specifically pneumonia at the end. And the origin is also considered to be bats with the intermediate host being uh, the dormitory camels. This one, unlike SARS, has a limited human-to-human -human transmission. Close contact with very sick people is required to actually get it. So it's relatively contained in Saudi Arabia, but spread to 27 countries total. There were 2,562 confirmed cases and about 881 deaths. Global mortality for MERS was about 35% and is considered to still be ongoing. However, still in the Middle East, no vaccine has been approved for that one either. However, transmission for that is very small. And as of 2014, only two cases came to the United States and we haven't seen any since then. And a visual on that pandemic from the World Health Organization, there you can see the visual between the cumulative deaths and the cumulative cases. And here, this is just a little table. Like was mentioned earlier, there was 39 known coronaviruses to us, seven of which can affect humans. Um, again, symptoms here can range from the common cold to severe illness, which could also be fatal. So we have all our human coronaviruses that we know of there, including SARS-CoV-2. And we kind of mentioned before, they do come a result of lots of contact with animals, which tend to be the host for a majority of the coronaviruses that we know of. And the rate that they enter into the human population depends on a lot of different factors, one of which is being our personal exposure to animals that carry these pathogens. So if you can see um, under pathogen pressure, human behavior is a factor as well as butchering or preparation of eating different meats, as well as um, bites and basically contact with the different animals could increase your risk of exposure to a virus, which could lead to a spillover event. So now we're going to talk specifically about SARS-CoV-2, which is responsible for the COVID-19 infection. So again, this is a new virus to us since December 2019. First outbreak was in Wuhan, China. This, like coronaviruses, is a single-stranded RNA virus and originated in bats. The genomic likeness is very, very similar to bats and infects, as we talked about, the upper and lower respiratory tract. It actually has milder symptoms than SARS-1 and MERS, as can be seen by the death rate, mortality rate is much less, but the human-to-human -human transmission is a lot more likely, a lot more easily transmissible from person to person. And so the total number of cases, instead of being limited to, what was it, 8,000 or so for SARS-1 and 2,500 for MERS, you know, now we're talking this global, millions. yeah, millions of infections that have spread very, very quickly and easily. 
Currently, our knowledge on the animal origin of SARS-CoV-2 remains incomplete. Where it actually came from, what was the host? There's some news stories about it uh, originating in a lab. I don't know the answer to it. I would just say it started in an animal and how it actually got to Wuhan. I, I can't really conclude one way or the other on that. This is just looking at estimated case fatalities for pandemics in general. SARS had a 10% mortality rate. SARS-1, MERS had a 35%. But again, the numbers were so incredibly small compared to what we've, we've experienced with, with SARS-2. Can you imagine if we had a MERS-type mortality with a spreadability like we have in our current one? That would, that would be a a true disaster. And not that this wasn't a disaster, but that would be, you know, infinitely more. The case fatality rate for a seasonal flu typically ranges just as a comparison between 0.1 and 0.2% in the US. Though that's the seasonal flu in the vaccinated US. So because we do get vaccines for the flu virus, that's going to temper that, right? If you took the vaccine away, you'd have a seasonal flu fatality rate of something significantly different than what we see with the flu today with the ongoing vaccination. And the Ebola outbreaks typically have up to 50% case fatality rate. Case fatality rate is basically calculated by the number of people that died from the disease divided by the number of people who tested positive. So that's what actually comes with the case fatality, fatality rate. Currently, the case fatality rate in the U.S. for COVID-19 is less than 2%. Influenza, again, 0.1 to 0.2% case fatality rate. So now we're going to talk about how it spreads. So transmission, respiratory droplets is considered the primary route of transmission via coughing, sneezing, sometimes singing and talking. Contact with contaminated surface is possible because they have detected viral RNA on surfaces, but it's also unlikely, and I'll talk about why in a little bit. And aerosols are the little fine particles that are suspended in the air. That is very debated. It is possible because they have taken air samples and found RNA virus in rooms with people that have um, COVID-19, but it's un unlikely to be the primary method of spread. And feces, they also detect RNA virus in there, but it's also considered to be a very rare method of spreading. And the reason why it's considered to be rare is because something called minimum infectious dose. Um, and that basically is the amount of virus that it takes to get someone infected. And so why they're not sure if con um, contaminated surfaces or aerosol or feces is a viable route for transmission. One, there's not a lot of studies that demonstrate it. And two, they're not sure if the viral load of those routes is enough to cause someone to be infected. And these are just from some articles that have been written recently on the transmission. Um, it says epidemiologic data suggests that droplets expelled during face-to-face -face exposure during talking, coughing, or sneezing is the most common mode of transmission, and that brief exposures to asymptomatic contacts are less likely to result in transmission. Contact surface spread through touching a surface with a virus on it is also a possible mode of transmission, but the clinical significance of SARS-CoV-2 transmission from inanimate surfaces Difficult to interpret without knowing the minimum dose of virus particles that can initiate infection. Detection of virus on surfaces reinforces the potential for transmission via fomites oh, and reinforces the need for adequate hygiene. However, droplet spread via face-to-face -face transmission remains a primary mode. This is concerning aerosols. Um, little droplets that remain suspended in the air. It says it's unclear if it is a significant source of infection in humans outside of the laboratory setting. So more studies and more tests need to be done to confirm on um, that possible route. And there we talked about minimum infectious dose. I just wanna comment on that. Just because you find viral RNA doesn't mean it's in a high enough concentration to cause disease. So exposure criteria then is a close contact within six feet of an infected person for a total of 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period. 
And an infected person can spread COVID-19 starting from 40 hours or two days before the person has any symptoms or test positive. That's uh, considered a pre-symptomatic period and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So here's a, a question. Transmission, is asymptomatic transmission a thing? There's a wide variety of reports. I think in general, most of the literature, most of the news reports talk as if this is a reality. There are a various number of studies that quote ranges of asymptomatic spread, but it's very interesting because when you actually look at these sources and go back to original articles, it's very hard to find any data to support really any of this. I have went to several of the original articles that were referenced. One was a computer model that was putting in numbers, trying to calculate transmission and spread. And that's one of the main articles in JAMA that is, that is actually looked at and referred to as far as asymptomatic asymptomatic people. So what an asymptomatic person is, someone who has never had symptoms, doesn't have symptoms, but tested positive for COVID. And so the computer model came up with numbers, but that had actual no real testing, no real anything. The other reference I found was back to an article in Wuhan where six people in a family uh, five people in a family were infected, and one of the persons was infected in the family was asymptomatic but and tested positive, and they were the first ones to get it. The next person in the family got it was 19 days later, and the, the assumption was that they got it from this asymptomatic family member. But there was no real evidence or proof that they couldn't have gotten it from somewhere else, and that was a single case. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because there were several larger studies looking at one with over a thousand people who were asymptomatic and tested positive, another with over 500 people that were asymptomatic people that had it. And what the CDC did and the other one was contact trace people in, in China, another was another location but they contact traced these people and backtracked everyone they came in contact with. And in both of those studies, they found basically no one that they gave it to. So these are real world people that tested positive, trying to backtrack and find people that they gave it to. And a fairly large number, not just five people that were in a family group and not just a computer model, but actually doing, and they weren't able to find it. So I don't think anyone is going to say that an asymptomatic person with COVID-19 cannot give it to someone. I think it is there, but it is, I would say it is, it is safe to say based on the real world data is that it is the exception rather than the rule. So can these things happen? Yes. And can you find a single case? Yes. But is that what's happening in the great multitude of cases? I would say the data says no, probably not. But pre-symptomatic transmission is completely different. So a pre-symptomatic transmission is someone who doesn't have symptoms at the time because we know people that are going to get symptoms are the most infectious 48 hours before they actually get their first symptom. Mm -hmm. And so you can't really tell the difference at the point of two days before someone gets symptoms between someone who never will have symptoms or someone who will get symptoms. The idea is, and this makes sense to me from a medical standpoint, that if someone who never gets symptoms probably never really gets a significant viral load that they can actually spread significant amount to make it a significant dose exposure, Whereas someone who's building a real life infection and within 48 hours is now going to, can have lots more virus in their body and can then transmit it. So, I mean, it makes sense to me that, that, that that's possible. So that's pre-symptomatic transmission and that's a real thing. So I guess if you said, can asymptomatic people transmit the virus? Oh yes, for sure. And primarily, though, it will be in those people who, within 48 hours, will have symptoms. 
So now we'll talk a little bit about how COVID-19 affects the body. Um, this is important just because it helps us understand how the disease um, works and the different symptoms that we see. So we have seen that the virus binds to ACE2 receptors on the cells of our body, and those are primarily found in the lungs, esophagus, mouth, heart, intestines, bladder, and kidney. And they also found that type 2 transmembrane serine protease, um, as abbreviated there, also promotes viral entry into our cells. And interestingly enough, that enzyme, that protease, is found particularly in the lungs. And that explains why we see COVID-2 having affinity for lung infections and upper and lower respiratory infections, as well as um, increased risk for pneumonia and um, respiratory complications. Kind of like how we talked about in our last lecture, your body detects the coronavirus and it starts off with an immune response to try to contain the virus. So your adaptive immunity kicks in and starts trying to generate antibodies. And different factors determine on how well your immune system is able to function and fight off this disease. If you have a swift innate immune response, this is the initial um, generalized attack on any invader. But if you have a swift innate immune response to COVID-19, you have a greater chance of viral clearance. The longer the virus sits in your body, the more likely it is to kind of hide in the cell and replicate. And the more it replicates, the more your body's gonna have to deal with, more virus it will have to fight. So a delayed innate immune response would result in an increased likelihood of efficient and excessive viral replication, decreases your chance of viral clearance. It would increase your risk of severe disease because you have more virus in your body. It would increase your risk for viral shedding and increase your transmissibility. And it would also increase your risk for complications such as pneumonia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, septic shock, multi-organ failure, and eventually death if your body was overwhelmed by the virus. And uh, individuals that are susceptible to a delayed response, I'll just touch on those. It's mostly the elderly, and this fits with the increased risk for severe disease that we see among the elderly. Part of that is different factors in the immune system um, become less quick in responding in the elderly and various other health risks and things can impair our um, health as well, which we'll talk about in the future. Just to touch on some things from Piedmont Healthcare, some immune suppressors are sugary foods and drinks such as soda, processed foods, <laughs> refined carbohydrates, alcoholic beverages, and tobacco products. And we'll touch more on these and look at some studies in our next lecture on immune busters. Let's talk a little bit about symptoms. Most of you have heard about these in the news. Hopefully, that's all it's been. Some of us have actually experienced these symptoms. Basically, this, this slide is to tell us that there is a huge range of uh, symptoms for COVID-19. So it can be from asymptomatic to mild respiratory infections to basically pneumonia or life-threatening sepsis and organ failure. So that's the just the general overview of this. Anyone can have anywhere from mild to severe symptoms, but we do know that older adults, individuals with underlying medical conditions, long heart disease or diabetes will be at increased risk. So the rule is generally higher risk for the older adults and those that are debilitated for more severe infections. Otherwise, it's a wide range of flu-like symptoms. Symptoms will typically appear from two to 14 days after an infection. That's why when the health department, if you've had it, will basically ask what you've done in the last 14 days. And the other part thing they'll ask you is where have you been in the last 48 hours? Because they'll want to contact trace everyone that you've been in contact with because of that 48 hour infect infectivity. But as far as looking for the source, where did you pick that, that up? That's two weeks. So for instance, when I came down with COVID in November, I had traveled, but I had traveled three, three and a half weeks before that. And, and so that really was in that 14 day window and the health department was not interested in that as far as a source of infection. Some of the more common symptoms, fever and chills. I can say I had that. So you, some, some folks will have a cough or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. That's more the uh, getting into the worried about pneumonia. 
And thankfully, I didn't have any of that. Severe body fatigue, I had that one. Muscle and body aches, I had that one. Headaches, I had that one. Loss of taste or smell, I didn't have that one. Sore throat, I didn't have that one. Maybe a little congestion, no nausea or vomiting, but I did have a profound loss of appetite. And so maybe that's part of the nausea. And then some bowel symptoms, that's another symptom. Sometimes COVID-19 can be complicated by long-term effects. Some of the complications first with uh, an acute infection would be actually pneumonia or hypoxia, respiratory failure, organ failure. Uh, ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome is basically respiratory failure, blood clots, kidney disease, and then also secondary infections. Other viral infections or bacterial infections are a possibility because they can set in while your immunity and your body is in a weakened condition. Some of the long-term effects, so you've heard about kind of long-term COVID symptoms that people have. This is real, but again, it's the exception rather than the rule. Most people have an acute infection that lasts for a week to 10 days, sometimes a little longer, and that's it. But there are some that because of the mass, vast numbers that have had some ongoing fatigue, shortness of breath, cough, joint pains, chest pain, muscle pains, headaches, sometimes palpitations, loss of taste and smell usually comes back. That's the rule, but occasionally it may not. Um, sometimes there can be some sleep, memory and concentration issues hair loss and rash. It's more of an acute issue. There are some acute rashes that come from COVID that kind of look almost like a type of lupus of the skin. We think it's because of complexes that are forming, immune complexes that are forming and causing little arterial occlusion. So that can lead to little bumpy spots on the skin. 80% of infected individuals have mild symptoms to no symptoms at all. So the great majority, I would say then beyond that, maybe another 16% have moderate symptoms, a 4% or so, uh, depends on location, but may end up hospitalized. And then there is a overall case fatality rate. And you can see here for the United States, we have 1.8%. When you look at overall the case fatality rate in all the countries, poor Mexico is really standing out there. And then you can see it going down. And I was surprised when I saw this graph because the way the news has, has progressed, it made it seem like, boy, the United States is in trouble and we have this huge case fatality rate compared to other parts of the world but our case fatality rate is not too bad uh, compared to other places. Why India's is so low is a good question. Everything, of course, is dependent on reporting and testing and things like that. Just kind of going back to case fatality rate, remember the case fatality rate is the number of deaths from the disease divided by the number of confirmed cases of the disease. But if you actually take the number of cases per disease, which we don't actually know, and we won't know till the end, then we don't actually know what the case, real case fatality rate is. Because if the number of cases is, let's just say 10 times more than we are actually measuring, then the case fatality rate in the United States would be 0.18%, not 1.8%. And it turns out they've actually done some studies and looked at this to say, well, how many people who've never tested positive or never done anything, how many of them have had COVID? And so they've taken different centers around the country and they've done antibody studies to see if they've had the disease. So when people are getting their cholesterol done and different things like this all around the country, just randomly, they just started looking and they got ranges from anywhere from 6% to 25% of the people they tested had had COVID, but had no history of having any symptoms or had ever tested positive, which means they are, those would truly be part of the N, the number of people that had the disease, but are never counted which again would drive the case fatality rates. Some people are estimating that conservatively, you know, for every one person that tests positive, there's 10 people that have had it but never been tested. 
So those are kind of conservative estimates, which would, again, take our numbers of people that have actually had COVID-19 and increased it by tenfold, which would take our case fatality down to 0.18%. But the, but the spreadability and the ubiquitous nature of COVID-19 and how quickly it spreads and how far and wide it spreads is incredible compared to some other pandemics. And this is just a scatter plot across the world about case fatality rates uh, versus confirmed cases. So why do mortality rates differ from country to country? So for against Mexico is 10% or 1.8%. So one testing availability and frequency is one. So if you're only testing the people that are super sick, and that end up in the hospital, then guess what? Your case fatality rate is gonna be very, very, very high. Population demographics, the healthcare system resources, other unknown factors. So case fatality rates can differ from place to place. And that's kind of what we see as seen across the board. All right, so then cumulative confirmed COVID-19 death cases. And this is comparing the cumulative number of cases are over a million worldwide. And the case fatality rate is, is of course, way, way down here in the purple line. But I think worldwide comes to around 3% if you average it out. So um, global cases were 118 million. The global deaths were 2 million, which is about 2%. And we had, one, like I said, 1.8 in this country. Now, Humboldt County... We had 3,326 confirmed cases. There were 34 deaths, um, 3,174 people recovered. There was 134 hospitalizations, which was around three or 4%. So our total mortality in Humboldt County was 1.1%. Yay, rural healthcare. All right, so we are going to talk about who is at risk for severe disease and just some complications. Anyone can get infected with the virus, but certain people have different factors that would make them at increased risk for severe disease and complications. And like we've mentioned, older adults, just because of how immune systems work and change as we get older, and individuals with certain medical conditions also put them at risk. Some of those are certain types of cancer, some kidney diseases, COPD, Down syndrome, heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, immunocompromised states such as, you know, you can be taking some medications that can do this. If you've had a recent organ transplant or you donated some bone marrow, you might be lacking some of what helps produce a good immune uh, system at the fundamental level from the bones. If you have a BMI greater than 40, what does that mean? That you have a high BMI. Yeah. That means so if you you're... have a higher BMI, you're obese. If you're considered obese, um, you are at increased risk for complications and severe disease. And it's actually because your body is in a state of inflammation, which makes, which makes your immune response compromised. Smoking and vaping also harms the lungs and can inhibit your immune response, as well as some lifestyle related diseases like type 2 diabetes. Children, I'll just make a note, children in, in general um, are not at risk for severe disease, although some of it has, you have seen severe disease in some children, but it's usually in individuals that have another medical complication. Okay, reinfection risk. Reinfection basically means you're getting reinfected with the same virus. It has been reported, but it seems to be rare. And... Because of how our immune system work, we develop antibodies. So reinfection with the exact same disease seems very unlikely. It can occur, so I'm not going to say it's not impossible. If you were to be reinfected, it would be more likely with a new, a new viral strain. They're still learning and doing studies to further understand the reinfection risk and how that all works. There's a lot that we're still learning and trying to figure out. COVID-19 variants. These come about as a result of mutations that happen in the genetic RNA. Last I checked, I think there's three going around the world. And actually virus variants are expected. It's not something that's a surprise and it's something that we expect to see over time. 
and different viruses or variants, depending on how they are, they emerge and disappear. Some stick around, like the B117 variant um, that was first discovered in the UK. And since then, it's become the more prominent strain over there and has spread to other different parts of the world. They do think it spreads more easy. And however, they're not sure if it causes more severe disease. We are waiting to see how that all plays out. More studies and things need to be done in that area. There are lots of unknowns, but good news is the vaccines are still anticipated to work well against these new variants. Yeah, I don't think there's been any great, I think the concern is that vaccines may not cover some of the variants or people who have had previous infections may not be protected but I don't think they've found any great examples where that mm -hmm. is actually the case. They're they, just- They're anticipating it all to, all to work. Yeah. Testing. So I'm um, just a brief, most folks are pretty familiar with what's happening with testing. I'm just gonna just cover this rather briefly. First, we have the test to actually measure the virus by measuring the, the mRNA of the virus by looking for the nucleic acid sequence. So they have some PCR testing. PCR testing is very, very sensitive. It's basically an amplification method. You could have one or two or just a few copies of the RNA strand that can be amplified enough to actually see it and test positive. So it's a very, very sensitive test. So sensitive that if you have COVID and you're over it, your PCR test will be positive for up to 60 days afterwards because of kind of dead shedding virus. And so that can sometimes be the cause of some tests that are positive and people that may have been asymptomatic but are over it. And so there's all kinds of confusion that can come for it. It's a very good test. If you have it, it's positive, then you, you know, then you likely have the, the virus. Antibody tests is another thing that basically tells you if you've had the infection, uh, you can actually measure your antibody response. It doesn't actually show up until one to three weeks after your infection or your symptoms began. So if you do an antibody test too early, it might come back negative mm -hmm. and not be accurate. It's probably not helpful. I did an antibody test because I wanted them to quantitate my antibodies, but they're not actually doing a quantitative test. I think they do that in, in some of the research programs for the vaccines, but they're not actually doing it in clinical practice right now. It's basically either, yeah, you've had it or no, you didn't. And so in my case, I knew I had it. So the antibody test didn't really add any information. So who should be tested? Well, if uh, basically, if you have symptoms, you should be tested. So anyone that thinks they may have had it should be tested. The question about close contacts, if I've had a close contact, should I be tested? I, I would say, you know, you could, and that's based on everyone's individual response. The health department isn't necessarily urging that everyone that has had a meaningful contact with someone from COVID rush out and get a COVID test. But if you're concerned about spreading it and you can't quarantine or something like that, then maybe that's a reason to do it. Basically it comes down to if you are symptomatic and you've been exposed or and symptomatic or you think you have it because of the symptoms that you have, that's when you should be tested. And your healthcare provider can refer you to that and your local health department. If you think you've had a sp exposure, you can contact the health department. They're very, very helpful at guiding you through what to do and, and what's appropriate. They have a really good algorithm that they're following there. Some lifestyle things that can help in aiding your immune response so you have a swift one, which will increase your chances of getting the virus before it replicates too much in your body are don't smoke, eat more fruits and vegetables, get regular exercise, maintain a healthy weight, reduce or eliminate alcohol, get adequate sleep and strive to minimize stress. Who recommended that? Harvard Health recommended oh, okay. these things. <laughs> okay. And we will be talking more in depth about how these things can aid your immune system in lecture number four. So vaccines. So how do vaccines work? Basically, vaccines work by stimulating the body's immune response to mimic an infection without actually getting the actual infection. Note on vaccines, not they don't usually prevent infection, but they do prevent um, the infection from spreading within the body from causing more severe disease. 
So I've had some folks tell me that, you know, what's the point of getting the vaccine if I can still get it? And the point of the vaccine isn't to make it so that you don't ever get the disease, but it's to prevent the severity in your own body by giving you a leg up against the, the disease you're getting vaccinated against. Almost making you like one of the asymptomatic people that had it COVID and got exposed to it, but your body just jumped right on it. So you never really shed it that much and never really got symptoms. Yeah. So in that way, it can also help reduce transmission, where if you do come in contact with the real virus that your body's already got a head start on it and it can prevent you from having a more severe infection and more severe viral sh shedding and decreased transmissibility in that way. Different types of vaccines, traditionally, they give a weakened or dead version of the actual virus. Um, as far as I know, we're not giving one of those out, but we are giving more of the newer methods, which are viral, vector, DNA, messenger RNA based. Safety and efficacy, they've been tested and deemed safe as possible as they can be in this situation that we have. All of them have been issued by the FDA with emergency youth authorization, and they'll continue to monitor and make sure it is safe for the human population. Side effects for the different vaccines tend to be flu-like symptoms such as fevers, chills, fatigue, and headache, sometimes pain and swelling at the site of injection. Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine, those are messenger RNA vaccines, and we have the new Johnson and Johnson vaccine. Yep, and Johnson Johnson vaccine works a little different. It works more like the flu vaccine, where it is an adenovirus, modified adenovirus that has the DNA sequence that would encode for the the spike protein in that, and then that basically gets taken into the nucleus. The DNA gets trans to messenger RNA that gets exported out and then the protein is made outside. So it just works a little different, more like how our flu vaccine works. And it's a single shot. Uh, because the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine is a single shot, you get about 70 to 80% immunity, whereas you're getting about 90 to 95% with the Pfizer and Moderna two-shot series. And it's just that they were tested that way. If you did a Moderna and Pfizer single shot, mm -hmm. you'd get probably about 70 to 80% immunity with, with the single shot of Pfizer and Moderna. And they just did their studies looking at a two-shot protocol and, and that boosts the immunity higher. Vaccine distribution, I believe we've gone through phase one already and we're currently in phase B with frontline essential workers and 75 and older. And you have a little more information about C. Yeah, we're starting to have people now in phase 1C, which 65 to 75, we're seeing some of those folks. And then people with underlying con health conditions, we're seeing that actually happening too. So I think we're moving into 1C mm -hmm. right now as far as immunizations. And you can check any immunization center if that's something you're interested in. The uh, St. Joseph's and Mad River Hospital have a program that they're doing and a lot of times at the end of the day, there's extra vaccine. And because the vaccine is very unstable, it can't be stored. So any unused vaccine has to, once it's diluted and reconstituted, it has to be used. What the certain vaccine lots have to be used at a certain time. So you can always check with those centers. And sometimes at the end of the day, if they have extra vaccine, you're not skipping in line. You're preventing vaccine from being wasted. Because <laughs> it'd rather it go in somebody than rather than it. it be wasted. Yeah. So um, what can we do to decrease our risk for infection? So we're talking primarily immediately right now, what can we do? And this is just the same for pretty much any viral or infectious type of agent, and especially viruses, you know, washing our hands really well, avoiding close contact with people that are sick or have it. If you are sick, so just think about this, the face covering primarily is to prevent you from spreading your droplets and sharing them with other people. And the face covering is primarily if you are sick. And this is what they've been doing in Asia for a long time. This is important and this can be helpful. So proper coughing and sneezing etiquette, you can go on Mythbusters and watch one of their back episodes and they'll show you how to sneeze <laughs> and not to spread things. And they have different ways that they've you know, shown to do that. Cleaning and disinfecting regularly and monitoring for symptoms. Masks, 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 masks. So the current 
CDC recommendations for masks basically are to wear them especially because of the ongoing pandemic. And that is to, again, prevent you from spreading your droplets. And so we're all kind of keeping, you've heard what they say in school, the teachers always say, keep your hands to yourself. Well, this is basically keep your droplets to yourself. And this is what the wearing the masks is all about. And this is what the health departments are asking people to do. There's various studies and sources that have looked at to see, you know, do masks really work? It's really, it's really hard to look at the data. There's not a lot of studies, real, real world, world studies studies that have looked at that and can actually answer that question really well. There's some, and we're trying to use those studies and extrapolate to try to say, yes, wear masks. And it has become a, you know, a social political type of issue, which is sad because it, it probably doesn't need to be. We know that N95 masks work better at blocking things. Medical grade surgical masks work. So we can compare these different masks and see how well they shield. But again, they're not actually asking the question, do they decrease spreading the virus COVID-19? So you can extrapolate and say, yeah, they, they probably help. The CDC recommends wearing a mask in public setting, outdoors if you're less than six feet apart, indoors, that's the current recommendation that we are wearing masks right now. And there's some um, different types of things, loose woven fabric, one layer things, exhaled valve vents, ski masks and scarves probably are not as good. So CO2. So when we breathe our own air all day, does it, are we breathing in the carbon dioxide? Are we getting low uh, oxygen levels? And the answer is no, there's really no evidence that that's the case. So there's, there is really no evidence that it's harmful, although there are some people that really can't. We're not recommending that children less than two wear masks, probably because they're going to be touch their face a lot more. And that's probably more of a risk for spread of disease. And I would say if any one of us, no matter what our age is, can't keep our hands off our face and our hands are constantly going to our face with or without a mask, that's probably the greater risk of transmission if we get things on our hands and, and touch our face. But really the greatest risk of transmission is being around someone that's sick, that's coughing and sneezing, right? That would be it. Further resources, if you're ever interested in learning more or learning the most up-to-date stuff about COVID-19 and all this health stuff, you can always call and talk to your local health department or any or your primary health care provider. Also, going to Humboldt.gov, they have a local update about the happenings with COVID-19 in our community. CDC also provides pretty helpful information. They try to keep it up-to-date. The California Department of Public Health has some information about vaccine distribution. And then I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. John Campbell, but he has um, a YouTube channel and he's been following the pandemic actually since it, since it started. And he's really fun to watch and listen to. He just goes through recent scientific articles that come out and does a really good job about explaining and talking about how things are changing from a medical and scientific paper perspective. So always check him out on YouTube. And what can you do to decrease severe risk of disease? I find it interesting how CDC and in general, we talk about how to prevent getting infected, but we never talk about how to decrease our risk of severe disease. And you can actually do that by several different lifestyle factors. We will be looking at these factors in our fourth lecture. Like I mentioned before, it helps with general efficacy of your immune system as well as overall quality of life and health overall. All right, so that brings us to the end. Our next class will be on habits that hurt immune busters. So we want to, we're going to be considering immune builders in our fourth class, but we're going to look at immune busters in our class next week, things that weaken your immune system and put you more at risk for more severe disease or, or disease at all. And we'd like to hear your questions, comments, input. If you have some references that we can consider that we haven't considered, we are certainly open to that. Um, so let's hear from you. I think it's approved down. One of them was, I don't remember which one, but one of the vaccines was approved down to 16 and they're starting um, trials in individuals under 16. 
to and 12 some of them to yeah, 12. 6, 12 to yeah, 16 to 12 so they're they're testing it and trying to make sure it's safe so and i can assure you that in the pediatric departments at your universities and things like that who have kids under 16 who have other complicated infections and things like that or complicated diseases and and should probably be vaccinated they're already looking at that and and outside of what the vaccine companies are doing they're probably already looking at those things knowing they have patients that need need protection That is a great, a great question. And yes, I've heard that. So the first of all is the, this is what's so neat about the messenger RNA vaccine. It's really cool. Because messenger RNA does not go from the cytoplasm of the cell into the nucleus. Actually messenger RNA, when we make our own messenger RNA that's translated from our DNA, it is exported from the nucleus where our DNA is into the cytoplasm. So it doesn't, it doesn't go the other way. And so the likelihood of you know, th that passaging that is, isn't really going to happen. If you got infected from the virus, you are gonna actually be exposed to much more messenger RNA than you are be from the vaccine. And there's no evidence or there's no study that people who are infected from the virus are getting their DNA changed. And we don't expect anything like that to happen. So that, that the mechanism, the molecular biology mechanism or for that to happen is unknown to me. This is what you'd expect physiologically. If you've never been exposed to the virus, and you've never seen it before, you probably won't have any symptoms with the first vaccine. But again, we're, we're gonna say that's the rule, but there's exceptions, right? So some people do. So, but most people really don't have much with the first, but they have it with the second. And this is why it's worse with the second is because now you've seen the protein. Now you have an immune, you have some antibodies, you have some memory cells that are set up for this. And now you're seeing the spike protein for the second time. So your, your body's That's reacting. So actually your body's doing exactly what it should do when it sees a virus and you get this kind of flu-like symptom again. Um, but it varies. I, I, will say, I won't say that no one ever has a bad reaction to a vaccine. That would be ridiculous. But again, that's not the rule. That's the exception. And there are exceptions. And sadly to say nothing that we inject in our body we can never say it would never have a risk. And you just a matter of weighing the risk and the benefit to everything. I think the risk is extremely low though. And you, but your DNA won't change. We don't have any evidence that that's gonna incorporate into your DNA.